Welcome to Pardon the Corruption. Uh, back after the Raptors beat the Hornets by a lot to a not so much. Uh, joining me today is Raptors Republic writer Sahal Abdi making his debut for Pardon the Corruption. You nervous, man? I'm I'm not too nervous, but I have seen the hosts you've had on here, or I should see, I should say the co-hosts, and um, you've set a pretty high bar. So so I'm excited to get this started. Okay, so we got a packed agenda. Uh, part of it is fueled by uh, last night's win, the, the Raptors beating the Hornets. Uh, and a lot of people look good in that game. One of them was Matt Thomas. Uh, and I, I always get his name right, Thomas, Thomas, whatever. English is not my first language, so it's, 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 it's a bit of an issue. Uh, yeah. But uh, Samson Folk did a nice little video of him on what he could have done. The comment section was filled with a lot of talk about, hey, if Nick Nurse had only done this against the Celtics, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. What's your take on Matt Thomas? Uh, just to start the season, what's your projection on this guy? Okay, like, look, if, you know, Matt Thomas is one of those guys that if you're not a Raptors fan and you follow a lot of NBA Twitter heads, you're probably wondering why we're talking about him so much. I mean, Matt Thomas is a guy that's, that came in kind of as an unknown last year. We knew he was a good shooter, but would that translate to the NBA? We weren't sure. Last year, I don't want to say he lit the league on fire when he was on the court, but the man shot 48% from three. So, I mean, if you weren't impressed with Matt Thomas, what, what he did last year in a limited role, I don't know what to tell you. Um, we all know he's one of the best standstill shooters in the, in the league. Um, and we did see some flashes of some off-the-dribble stuff last season, even in the bubble. Um, but, I mean, for the preseason game, he had 16 points, 5 for 9 shooting. He was 4 for 7 from beyond the arc, which is just about standard for him. I mean, 4 for 7 for any other players, like, wow. I mean, over 50%. But, I mean, Matt Thomas shot essentially 50% last year. Um, which is basically him hitting every other three-point bombs, which is which is unheard of, right? Even in the NBA, even in a shooting league like the NBA. So, I mean, um, for the preseason game specifically, I guess what stood out for me was two things. Um, number one was Thomas kind of recording five assists. Now, this is big. This is a guy who had who had an average of zero point five assists per game last year. Um, so he had a very particular fixed role last season. He didn't really get an opportunity to move the ball as much. Uh, his role was essentially catch ball, shoot ball. That's it, right? It ends there. Um, but Chris Finch, who, who's the Raptors' new um, assistant coach, has kind of seemed to grow his role in what we've seen thus far, um, where you're seeing Matt put in very specified locations in their offensive sets where he kind of has more freedom and he has more decisions to make, you know, shoot the ball, extra pass, uh, drive and kick, uh, whereas last season, it was really just Thomas coming off curls or just them, you know, fi him finding open crevices around the court to maintain spacing. Um, and then the second thing that stood out for me was his role. His role is, um, has, has evolved this year. Nick Nurse has made it clear that, you know, with um, all the departures that we saw last season or coming into the season, I should say, with Ibaka, Gasol, um, Matt Thomas is almost, almost guaranteed to have a bigger role in the rotation. I mean, naturally, right? Um, he kind of moves up moves up the pyramid in, in, in Toronto's rotation. Um, in the game versus Charlotte, he was the seventh man off the bench. Not bad, you know, seventh man off the bench. Um, even in a game where Lowry's not there, um, he was the seventh man. So that, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good job for Matt Thomas. You know, he has probably been doing really well in training camp. So um, for Matt, um, he's had a larger role. A guy like Chris Boucher is going to expect a larger role. We'll, we'll talk about Chris and some others later, but... Um, I'm excited, man. I'm super excited from what we're going to see about Matt Thomas. I'm excited in, in what he can bring to Toronto Raptors. And it's almost like every guard that the Raptors throw out there brings something unique that the others yeah. don't. There, there's a bit of a diversity in their skill set, which is really appreciated. And Matt Thomas is, is sticks out because there is no other guy who's a dead-on shooter like him. And and as you mentioned, like like Fred Van Vliet can't do what Matt Thomas does and vice versa. And, and this goes true with like every every other guard we have. Like Terrence Davis has his own unique skill set that 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 uh, Van Vliet and uh, and Thomas don't. So I, I like the fact that every person we come off the bench has something extra to kind of throw at the uh, at the defense. And and one point that you made that I that, that I that I've been saying for quite some time is that he's more than just a catch and shoot guy. He has a bit of a dribble in him. So when you yeah. when that initial screener kind of hedges a little bit to carve off that space that he's looking to shoot, he can go in. Maybe he won't drive all the way and finish with a crazy layup, but he will go like three four steps deep in and find that bounce pass or kick that out, which 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 is which not every dead eye shooter kind of has. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like I said, Matt Thomas's role is evolving. He used to just come off curls. He was the type of guy where he's coming into the game 
you kind of know what he's doing. You don't know what set the Raptors are running, but you know what his role is as a, as a defense. And I think early on in the season, he was hitting shots and, and teams knew he was a good shooter, but they didn't know he was that good. So then you saw later in the season, teams were sticking to him like glue. And then in the bubble, um, teams were kind of changing their defensive schemes to kind of account for Matt Thomas and what he can do. He's a devastating shooter for some teams. If you don't, if you don't, you know, hold on to him on, on certain curls, you don't get away with certain things with him. But um, Matt, I'm probably one of the guys I'm, I'm super, super excited. One of the, one of the ones I'm, I think is going to play such an important role. And I think when it really gets down to the nitty gritty with, with the Toronto Raptors and you go into the playoffs and the rotation shortens, I think you're going to see Matt. I mean, last year we didn't really see him because I mean, he can shoot the ball really, really well, but he's kind of a defensive liability. But that's another thing I want to talk about with Matt, where he looked energetic versus mm-hmm. Charlotte. He looked like a guy that um, wanted to play defense and 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 showed um, wanted to show Nick Nurse, hey, I've I've improved on this end of the floor. So I'm excited for for um, for Matt, what he can do early on in the season, and he's going to play a lot more. He's definitely going to play a lot more with guys. I think like Kyle Lowry, for example. I'm going to get into this later, but Kyle Lowry is going to, going to play, I think, a little less this season. He's going to get load managed with, with the compact schedule. But So you're going to see a guy like Matt Thomas a lot more. You might even see him start some games. So I'm yeah. definitely excited for what Matt brings you know, to the yeah, rotation. And, and, and to your point about defense, man, when you see everybody else on the team kind of give it their all on defense and that becomes the philosophy of the team, even though you're, you yourself are not a great defender or, or don't have a reputation of a defender, it, it's, got, it's got to motivate you to, to try that extra hard just because your teammates are doing it. So it's totally natural. You mentioned Lowry. Um, apparently he's not around. I, I'm not deep into Lowry's absence drama because I'm, I'm not really on uh, social media. But uh, to me, this is just a guy who's blowing off preseason because he wants to get a rest. To me, it's like not even a story. What have you heard? Yeah, so as far as we know from from all those that cover the Raptors, it's, it's that Lowry, quote unquote, was granted permission uh, to miss the first two games, right? And not travel with the rest of the team to Charlotte. Um, now people are going to make conclusions, right? Whenever you don't give, I guess, a clear, um, explanation of what's going on. I mean, nurses, Nick nurse has tried, but others in the organization are kind of hiding why Lowry's not there. And they're kind of letting us make our own conclusions, our own deductions, our own determinations. People are assuming things. So, um, with the pandemic going on, the obvious rumor, and I want to stress that this is just a rumor is that Lowry may have been, you know, diagnosed with something. Um, again, absolute speculation and, and it probably goes against most of what the Raptors have told us thus far. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, nurse, like I said, has probably been the most transparent about the situation. He said, you know, quote unquote, he said, listen, Lowry's in fantastic shape, maybe as good as I've seen him, especially at a start, maybe like this. So this could just be a thing where, you know, the compact season's coming up 72 games in what I think it was just over 140 days um, means that, you know, Lowry is probably going to have to start following a load management schedule, you know, to prevent um, a burnout or even worse, an injury at his age. Um, for what we've heard about Lowry hasn't been clear, but I think we can make pretty educated assumptions that maybe they're just trying to rest the guy. Duh. Like, I mean, what else could it be? I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, I've always seen like the, the regular season as a giant preseason for the postseason. Right. And I would expect nothing else of the Raptors then to manage their most important asset. Debatable. But I mean, certainly for me, he's the most important Raptor, at at least for for me. Uh, Why would you not manage him and and make sure that he's remember remember all those years with Dwayne Casey, where we lamented Kyle Lowry not being in shape for the postseason? He he picked up an injury on the second last uh, game of a meaningless end to, uh, to a regular season. And he hobbled his way through the postseason. And we were like, Oh my God! Why the hell are we doing this to ourselves? So it makes complete sense yeah. that, that that we're we're being proactive in his uh, in his minutes. So, man, it, to me, I have never never seen a non-story so big. Yeah, for sure. I mean, with Raptors Twitter, it's people love discussion. People love you know going back and forth. People love assumptions and and taking out their own conclusions of things. But I think with with Lowry, the guy is you know relatively an older guy now. He's played a ton of minutes these last six seven years. Um, he's went deep into the playoffs multiple times. This is a guy who, you know, last year, if his body broke down, people wouldn't really be surprised. I mean, this is a guy who's, I believe he's 34 now. So, um, Kyle's an older guy. And I think at this point, Nick Nurse has to look at it like, okay, this guy's our engine. He's probably our most important player. If we want to make, you know, a deep playoff run, this is going to be the guy that we have to keep healthy. So a load management, you know, schedule is something that's looking very, very likely for Kyle Lowry. Man, I'm I'm shocked he hasn't broken like all his ribs taking those charges yet. 
That, that, that I, I don't know how either. <laughs> I, I genuinely don't know. Uh, all right, let, let us talk about some uh, some up and coming players, which uh, which you you've shown a bit of an interest in, and and some people you think are kind of like on the cusp of maybe breaking into the big team or breaking in the, into the rotation. Uh, I think people who have seen this show uh, for a little while know that I'm a big Paul Watson guy uh, overall. Yeah. As a, I'm a, a love his, his shot. I had Kelsey on last time, and she spoke highly of him, and Blake as well, and everybody's a big fan of him. But there's maybe some other guys that that you have your eye on at, at, that you see kind of being on the cusp of. Uh, uh, if not greatness, then cracking that rotation. Yeah, I mean, there's guys that, um, like I said before, um, how Matt Thomas came into the year last year as an unknown. There's some unknowns this year. I mean, guys who Raptors fans haven't really seen much of, a guy like Yuta Watanabe. And I also want to stress the pronunciation for Raptors fans. Like, this guy might not get a big, you know, rotation spot this year, but he might just, you know, go to Raptors 905 and develop over there. But I think it's important that we get this guy's name right. Uh, Raptors fans, it's Yuta Watanabe. It's not Watanabe. It's not Watanabe. It's Watanabe. So let's get that out of the way, first of all. Um, I think a lot of Raptors fans have kind of been asking questions about what type of player he was prior to the preseason game. And I think they saw a little bit um, during Charlotte of, of what he offers. Um, I think it's important that we all know that Utah's chances of making the Raptors 15-man ro- roster or 12-man roster, obviously depending on what the NBA decides. Um, I think it's important that we realize his his roster chances are quite slim, to be to be very honest. Uh, the Raptors are super deep. You mentioned Paul Watson, and that guy is probably a 10th, 11th, maybe even a 12th man for the Raptors this year, right? Um, I think his rota- uh, Paul Watson's um, you know spot in the rotation is a lot more clear than a guy like Utah. And a guy like O'Shea. Um, and then you have another guy like DeAndre Bembry, um, who, if anyone's watched DeAndre Bembry before, he looked a lot like DeAndre Bembry, right? So we've seen him play before in Atlanta. Um, you know he's probably a very limited offensive player. He can put a shift in defensively, right? He's, he's very creative as a passer. Um, one play versus Charlotte that really stuck, stood out to me was when uh, – Bembry was leading the break in transition and he had, you know, tons of options to choose from. Um, and it was, it was very weird because at the play itself, you know, Charlotte had all five guys back. So when, when a team has all five guys back defensively, you would think it's not really a transition opportunity, <laughs> but Charlotte wasn't set. That was, that was the problem with Charlotte. They weren't really set defensively. Guys were still picking out their assignments. Things were not set. So Bembry knew this and he wanted to move fast and Nick Nurse loves this. So he wanted to move very fast. Um, he had options as he was crossing midcourt. He had Paul Watson, you know, in the right corner. He had Stanley Johnson in the left corner. He had Flynn in the, on the left elbow. And then he had Boucher trailing, right? And one of those things in transition for, for Nick Nurse is he's trying to see, um, can this guy diagnose what's going on around him? Bembry drove to the hoop, and he knew these guys were off balance. And for some reason, I think it was Caleb Harris, um, I believe that's his name, Caleb, Caleb Harris, Caleb Wilson on the, on the Charlotte Hornets. Um, he doubled Bembry immediately on the drive, and, and Bembry knew this. He knew Boucher was trailing him, gave a nice little, you know, behind, or I think it was under the legs pass for, for Bembry to Boucher. Uh, it was beautiful, and then that led to a wide-open three-point basket. So I think Bembry's a guy that's probably going to get, you know, a, a deep rotation spot for Toronto. Uh, and then you obviously have what I like to call the real on like on the cusp guys who, who are kind of future guys, 905 guys, Alizé Johnson, Henry Ellenson. And then you have the second round draft pick uh, Jalen Harris, um, who are all likely going to be 905 guys. But again, nurse wants to see what they can offer. Um, you never know what injuries are going to hit. So um, nurse definitely wants to see um, what each of these guys brings. And then uh, also one more thing back to O'Shea Brissett. He didn't play versus Charlotte. Um, that was likely due to knee surgery he had months ago. Um, and then also Nick Nurse um, probably just wanted to get a deeper look um, later in the preseason on O'Shea. Um, he may play the next game against Charlotte or even against Miami. Um, but I think O'Shea is almost guaranteed a roster spot. Um, I think he played well in, in, in very small moments for, for Toronto last year. So um, we'll see. We'll see with what, what goes on. But I think we're getting a very, very clear idea of what the Raptors roster I think is going to look like and what the... Um, lead men for the 905 is going to look like. 
Yeah, and I think every year you ha- you you know you you always have a crop of like maybe four or five guys who are coming through through the system, and every year maybe one or two of them start making their way towards like the real the, the big team or the rotation. Yeah. And and the guys you mentioned to me are still kind of in the background. Like they're still certainly not this year. You're not you're going to see them. You may, you may get a look at them, maybe a couple of call ups here and there. But this year, I find like the uh, the promotion, if you will, belongs more to like Matt Thomas. And mm-hmm. maybe to, to some extent, Paul Watson and also O'Shea Brissett, uh, Brissett, you mentioned. Did I get his name right? O'Shea Brissett? O'Shea Brissett, yeah. Because I've called him like oh, like a French name once. Um, yeah. <laughs> Brissett. I called him Brissett. I mean, to be honest, with the Raptors, it's like there's so many unique names that we kind of have to get used to. We, yeah. we have Canadians on our roster. We have a Japanese uh, player on our on our roster now. So there is some unique names, but I think it's all part of the, part of the fun. I think if yeah. any team's going to have – you know, a, a, a bunch of cultures and a mishmash of cultures is probably going to be the team that represents Toronto or represents Canada, I should say. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, so, yeah, so th- this year is about like the, the, the three guys I mentioned. The, the rest of the guys, I mean, you can check them out on the, at the 905 all season long. And man, 905, we talked about it before many times. And what an amazing little subplot to every season to follow like on the side. eh? Like, yeah. it's like whatever time you had free is now going to the 905 to check that out. I love it. Yeah, I love it. I love it. The Raptors 905. I mean, you look at the development that's been done there. Um, I have a, a friend of mine who actually works within the 905 organization, and he just tells me it's it's just the way how symbiotic I, I guess the relationship is between the senior roster and then the developmental roster is just mm-hmm. incredible. Um, Nick Nurse is is constantly checking in to what's going on mm-hmm. uh, with the 905, um, even the assistant coaches, and then you saw. Um, I believe it was uh, Coach Matumbo who's now coaching the 905 roster. It's not Jama Malalela anymore. Uh, Jama has moved on to the to the senior roster. He's now an assistant coach again with the Raptors. So I guess it's very just it's just very cool how the Raptors just keep rotating their coaches into the 905. And I think that just it's such a cool way for them to continue or to keep their continuity and also keep their coaches kind of uh, their voices heard. I guess you could say. Yeah, it's like a mother feeding her <laughs> baby through the umbilical yeah. cord is how the yeah, Raptors yeah. and the Raptors 905 are. Um, let's let's move on to our next uh, topic. Uh, same D, different O. So it sounds like a, a lot of the principles that the Raptors have kind of adopted as an organization, namely their defensive focus and, uh, and and the effort that they put out on the floor continues into this season. So the defensively, we sort of expect the same level of uh, competitiveness and tenacity that we've kind of gotten used to, but the offense this year might be a little different. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting because um, last year I think was more of a collective effort on both sides of the ball by the coaching staff. This year's totally different. I mean, Nick nurse told Raptors media, I believe it was last week that his coaching staff would have um, very defined roles compared to last season. Um, he, he even outlined which coach would be responsible for what. So the newcomer, Chris Finch would run the offense uh, Adrian Griffin, who was there last year, obviously, would run, would run the defense. And then um, Sergio Scariolo, who also happens to be, you know, Spain's international men's head coach, would run what Nurse kind of calls special teams. Um, what he can mean by that is, I guess, he's going to be running kind of offensive and defensive quality control um, type things. Um, with well, what the does other that mean? What does that mean, staff. quality control? Tell, tell me what that means. Like, So I think with quality control, it's kind of like um, – Finch is going to have what he deems is his system for the offense. And then same with Griffin for the defense. And then Scariola is going to be that guy that's kind of, um, he, he works a lot more with player development, but then he also with both the defense and offense, he has input into what um, the Raptors can take out of the defense and, and, and include as well. Scariola is a, a very good coach. We saw him, he won the FIBA, I believe it was the FIBA uh, gold with, uh, with Spain, Marc Gasol, He's a really good coach in his own right. So the Raptors have a very strong staff behind Nick Nurse. Uh, and Nick Nurse himself is, is obviously known as probably a consensus top five coach in the league. Um, so Scariola is just going to work, I think, with both um, the offense and the defense. And then also in a player development role, um, he's going to have a very good chunk of what goes on in each game plan for the Raptors. Mm-hmm. And then Nick Nurse is obviously going to be the guy who has final say. So um, with Griffin, specifically with the defense, the Raptors had tons of success last year, so not much really has to change. Um, they had very compact, fast defensive rotations. Um, they're very good at contesting three-point attempts. Um, in the preseason game versus Charlotte, we saw mainly a man-to-man defensive scheme, but 
we know Nurse and Griffin want their defense to kind of look like an amoeba. It's going to be constantly changing, constantly evolving throughout the game. And then Chris Finch, who's the newcomer from the New Orleans Pelican staff, um, is going to install his offense. But Nurse also made it clear that he's going to keep some principles from last year's team that made them quite successful in their own right. Um, Chris Finch is known well. He's renowned, I guess you could say, across the league as a very creative offensive mind, which is something the Raptors kind of lacked last season. They didn't really have that creativity at times when they needed it. Um, so, yeah, the Raptors, it's very cool how they kind of um, defined what roles each coach would have. And it kind of uh, serves as um, an accountability factor. I mean, if the offense isn't really running like they want it to for the season, they probably know that Chris Finch is the guy um, that's going to take the brunt of, of the blame for that. And then the vice versa as well. If the offense does really well, Chris Finch is, is going to get a lot of the praise. So yeah. I, I think it's it's very cool how the Raptors kind of uh, define the roles this season. Well, it's hard to innovate from a coaching perspective, right? I mean, especially yeah. from a management standpoint, innovation is hard to come by. It's kind of like a, one of those things that every organization is kind of searching for. So it's good to see yeah. the Raptors try to experiment with different configurations on coaches' responsibilities. You don't necessarily see that too often. And, and it kind of falls in line to the Raptors organization as a whole that has been forward thinking on a lot of these matters. And this just appears to be like, like one of those things. And, and, and Nick Nurse has basically hired Finch. And uh, this is the, you know, kind of a comment that I made in a WhatsApp group is that he yeah. has gotten his version. What, what he was to Dwayne Casey is what Finch is to him almost. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And we, we knew Dwayne Casey kind of had his limitations. I think Nurse is a little bit more of a well-rounded coach than Dwayne Casey at this point. We've realized that. But that's a very good point. I mean, Nick Nurse, if he knows that um, he can't kind of focus on the entire offensive structure of the team and defensive structure, he's going to hire a coach that, like Chris Finch, who has a very good offensive background, a guy who's been around the league. And then, like I said before, a guy who's renowned across the league as a very creative mind. Or, or, or Nick Nurse just getting lazy and getting, like offloading work. Could be that. Could be that. The simplest wants, explanation wants the sometimes is the best one. Oh, yeah, exactly. Wants to be on the guitar a little more. Who knows? Who knows what Nick Nurse is trying to do? He wants to dedicate more time to his band, maybe a little bit. Yeah, it could be that. <laughs> um, Flynn. Uh, we saw him for the first time. Uh, I personally was very impressed. I, I was manning the uh, Twitter account for Raptors Republic, and uh, there was one play that stuck out for me. Uh, it was where he he pressured the guy bringing the ball up the court. There was a screen, and he switched and pressured that guy, so he denied two drives. Then he then he uh, trailed his man and boxed him out. So when the shot missed, somebody else got the rebound. Overall, like immediately in one game, you sort of saw why the Raptors liked him. Yeah. And, and then you also see why the Raptors keep drafting seniors and 22 year olds instead of, you know, these 19 year old raw prospects. Malachi Flynn just looked like he belonged. Like it's really as simple as that. He didn't look like a fish out of water. He looked like he's been playing with this team for a few years. He had very, very good chemistry with Matt Thomas. He made a number of good reads. He looked very, very confident um, shooting the ball. I think he was three for six or three for seven from the outside. I believe it was three for six from the outside. His mechanics look really good. Um, but I think the comfortability factor is just what made him look very good on defense and offense. You mentioned a play where, like, he had the full pickup in backcourt, you know, cut off, switch, box out. I mean, he he's a guy that is a very well-rounded prospect. He's not a guy that lacks defensively. He's not a guy that lacks offensively. He has very good vision. He's a guy that I genuinely think, you know, he's going to just off his play alone. He's kind of going to force Nick Nurse to play him a lot early in the season, especially like we said, with Lowry getting breaks early on in the year. I think Malachi Flynn is going to come out and, and maybe be that eighth man, ninth man for Toronto. Mm -hmm. He's going to play a Terrence Davis role where they're going to rely on him um, quite a bit in some games. So I'm excited for Malachi Flynn. Um, I'm, I'm super excited that he understands the team concepts really well and that he didn't he didn't look out of place. Yeah, he, he didn't force anything. And, and man, yeah. it's just a great point about the seniors, man. DeLon Wright's another guy that they that they picked up like that and it was serviceable on day one. And same yeah. here. I, I think I... I I mean, it, it just makes so much sense to me. Like, unless you're drafting somebody with superstar potential, then yeah, you take a you kind of take a flyer on them. But when you're drafting that late in the draft, the chances of you finding like a 19 year old who's going to turn out to be the next whatever is probably low. So you may as well get something you can use right now. Yeah, and and you gotta love you know with the history of the Toronto Raptors. I mean, every late draft pick, the Toronto Raptors have been a very good team, you could say, for the last decade, which is why they keep getting these late 20s draft picks, right? Um, 
a lot of people liked Malachi Flynn. A lot of people that were connected with Toronto, uh, Toronto media liked Malachi Flynn, but they also liked some other guys a lot better. So um, when you look at it, I mean, when, when Siakam was drafted, we were kind of like, oh, well, we could have got maybe this guy. Like, who really is this guy? People were rushing to YouTube to search some Siakam clips. Um, kind of the same with DeLon Wright. People didn't really know who he was. He was an unknown. Okay, let's find out. Turns out to be a really good player for Toronto. Um, this is this is a nice cycle that Toronto's created where it's mm-hmm. like, we're going to draft the guy we believe in most. Raptors fans, you might not know this guy that that much, but hey, guess what? We've, we've sent scouts to these this guy's game you know, all, all year last year. And um, we're excited for what he can bring to the team. And then you see how comfortable he looks, you know, in his first preseason game. This is his first game of NBA action. So Malachi Flynn is, was definitely a bright spot for Toronto. And, and I think he'll remain a bright spot for their future. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And, and you know, like we had a lot of articles on uh, Rappers Republic covering the draft, bunch of people. We had a podcast, blah, blah. And man, I, I think Malachi Flynn was mentioned maybe like maybe twice <laughs> on yeah. offhand, just as you're reading off a list, if that, right? And that, that shows you the level of preparation that, the, that this franchise has and, and how, how, how stark the contrast is in our drafting strategy com- between now and what used to be in, you know, in the inception of the franchise and how, how many draft picks we have wasted. Like Joey Graham comes to mind. It, all these players come to mind and like, it's refreshing just to see, just to have faith in management when it comes to these things is a, is a, for is sure. A new, a feeling yeah. The player right. acquisition strategy for Toronto has just been incredible. I mean, free agency trades draft, um, having that type of faith in an organization. And then you have to also remember Things change very quickly in the NBA. Rosters change. A guy goes to free agency. You lose him in free agency. A guy might, you know, ask for a trade depending on what team he is. Things are always changing on NBA rosters. So for Toronto to maintain, you know, a very good depth and a very good, I guess you could say, rookie class every single year, um, that speaks volumes for what type of front office they have. And also, I also find that you sleep better at night knowing that yeah. the franchise is sort of in good hands. Like, you don't worry <laughs> yeah. about the Raptors as much as you used to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one one thing that comes to mind immediately when you say that is is when we lost Kawhi Leonard to the Clippers. Yeah. I mean, the immediate reaction was like, damn, like we lost our superstar. And then you think of it and you're like, well, we still got Masai Ujiri. You know what I mean? It's like we still got the front office intact. We still got the guys who who have created, you know, the bulk of this team, the the – the foundation of this team. So then that once that hits you, you start to kind of sit back, relax, and then you get excited for the next season, what's to come. I think now I know what Jerry Krause meant when he said uh, organizations win championships. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Literally, organizations win championships. And you could look, again, you could look at the last 10 years for Toronto, um, and you could say that their, you know, their title in 2019 was was well-deserved. This is a team that's been there, been there, been there. You can you can maybe say they've failed over and over again. But again, with the roster that they had intact, you can say that they also maximized what they had. And then finally, the first chance they get getting a superstar, a consensus top five NBA player. I don't want to talk about Kawhi Leonard too much because I know yeah. Raptors fans, some, some of them, some of them have, you know, some bad feelings towards him. But um, the first chance they get in getting a superstar, they, they win a championship. So mm-hmm. um, Toronto is probably, I would consider them, in terms of looking at the entire NBA landscape, they are probably the role models, um, as well as obviously some other organizations of the NBA. Uh, and by the way, that was a tongue-in-cheek comment about organizations yeah. win championship before you hate me and tell me I don't yeah, know yeah, what yeah. I'm talking about. Just, just that was yep. a tongue-in-cheek comment. Players have a lot to do with it, mostly about Players playing obviously the ball in the have basket. A lot so to do I with get that. it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let, uh, let, let's talk about one of those guys, man. Uh, I call it OG 4.0 because every year Love is it. a new version of OG. And last night, people were saying, like, we should be running our offense through him. You excited about OG? Oh, man. I was excited from what I saw in the bubble last, last uh, in the playoffs for OG. I mean, we yeah. saw the little flashes. But I guess for Charlotte, um, in the Charlotte first preseason game, we immediately saw that OG, one of his biggest criticisms, I guess, from Raptors fans is that um, just the, his lack of offensive creation. Um, but we're seeing that now. He looked less compact. He looked less robotic, I guess you could say, in his movements. His offensive repertoire is just evolving. And again, we saw flashes of that in the bubble. Um, and then OG said, I don't know if a lot of Raptors fans have seen this, but he said in a recent interview that he's been working on his off-the-dribble game and he's been working on his passing ability. So that self-awareness is there for what OG needs to um, improve on. And then 
OG's also going to play the five a lot more. He's going to play center a lot more in, in small ball lineups. We saw a little bit of it against Charlotte. Um, he's a very, very good rebounder for his size. Uh, very good interior defender. Um, just an overall very good defender. So I don't think Nick Nurse, other than size, is losing that much by playing OG in five, uh, in spurts at least. Um, but OG's overall versatility is something that the Raptors are going to rely on a lot more this season. Mm-hmm. He kind of gives the team different looks and keeps them on edge. Uh, we already know he's a very good three-point shooter. Um, I think he shot just around 40% last year. Um, but most people, you know, for good reason, have Ananobi um, selected as their MIP, most improved player candidate. Um and as weird as it sounds, it feels like a Toronto player is in the discussion for that award almost every year. I mean, <laughs> won it. Point, yeah, yeah. Fred Van Vliet was in the discussion. Um, and then yeah, I'm forgetting some guys in past years. But it um, feels like Toronto. And that, again, speaks to their player development, right? Yeah, I hear you. Uh, I, I'm not there on OG. Let's run the offense through OG. Uh, sure. But what I have yeah. noticed, again, from the bubble as well, and certainly from the, the one game in preseason, is that th- there's definitely more fluidity in his game when he has the ball. Like he feels, he seems more comfortable. Like we, we obviously we saw the behind the back, uh, you know, when the guy reached and he took it on and, and dunked it or whatever. But generally yeah. speaking, when he has a ball in his hands, you you ex- you feel more comfortable with him putting it on the floor more because previously yeah. if you send a guy over to help him as he's putting on the on the floor he has a tendency to pick it up and pass right away but now he's actually hanging on to it more and doing a spin doing something else which kind of continues the play rather than just kind of pass it off yeah and that's the thing i mean when og used to kind of dribble we would all hold our breath it's like yeah. okay what's going to happen now um with og now it seems like He's very. He's gotten much better at diagnosing defenses. It's not like he's driving in and kind of deciding on mm. that spot what he's yeah. going to do. Um, he kind of diagnoses what off what defense is looking at him in the face, and then he moves from there. Right. He even thinks about is this is it even worth dribbling in this possession or should I just hand the ball off? So I think that also just comes with time of being in the NBA. He's just become a much smarter player. Um, what I really, really, really want to see from OG this season is just that off the dribble shot. Because I noticed with OG, when he drives, it's usually a drive straight to the hoop. And then he kind of decides what he's going to do, whether it's like creation off the ball or whatever. But I think I really, really just want to see, you know, a, a drive stop for maybe a 15 footer, you know, just to keep defenses honest with OG. Um, but who knows? We might see that. He said he was working on that. So we might see that. It's a pull up. He, he needs a pull up. OG 4.0 is all about the pull up. And uh, and you're, you're bang on about uh um, about him not telegraphing what he's about to do. I think I think maybe that's the next evolution in OG's game is, as you said, is is the pull up jumper, and then yeah. he's already improved on just just giving the defense two things to think about when he has the ball, not just one. And and I think that's that's sufficient. And I think you know a couple of years back, somebody asked me like you know, or, or about a year and a half ago, they go, who has a higher ceiling, Pascal or OG? And I was like, of course it's Pascal, of course. Yeah. Of course, it's Pascal. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Dumb question. But do you see a day in our future where somebody asks Sahal this question, hey, who has a higher ceiling, OG and Pascal? And you respond, OG. Oh, man. It's tough because Siakam wasn't – like, I, I noticed with a lot of Raptors fans, they kind of have been talking um, about Siakam in – I don't want to say a bad light, but in, in a very critical light. Um, and that's all stemming from his his offensive display in the bubble, um, which is fair. I mean, recency bias runs NBA discussions, right? Um, people forget that this guy made the all NBA second team, right? So this isn't Siakam's not a player that just kind of waltzed into the into the bubble and then just like crapped the bed. People forget, you know, he wasn't he was an all defense, you know, guy. Um, I, I don't believe he won the award. But um, he was an all-defensive candidate. This Siakam's a guy who gave Jason Tatum, who's probably one of the best shot creators in the league, he gave him trouble in the bubble, right? Jason Tatum obviously had his moments. That's what superstars do. But um, he had he had trouble. Um, Siakam's still an elite defender in our league. And I think in the regular season, one of my friends, a lot of people know him as Suar Lasers on Twitter. I saw it. He, he mentioned a very good point with Siakam where he said, look, probably 25 or 26 teams in the NBA can't guard him. <laughs> like literally cannot guard Pascal Siakam. Mm-hmm. So I think with OG, uh, looking at what Siakam's accomplished thus far, he was an all, he's an all-star, all-NBA second guy. Can OG reach that? I personally don't think so. All-NBA second team is, is very, 
it's a very distinct honor to be to be a part of that. So I think with OG, I mean his 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 I think his ceiling is pro- I don't even want to say his ceiling is all NBA. I think he can just be one of the best three and D guys in the league, but also like kind of an advanced version of that where he can dribble. So um, I don't want to say that just yet because I'm taking away from Siakam. I'm but... not asking you to say it. I'm not, no pressure. Yeah, yeah. No pressure on that. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. by the way, Assad, uh, I have played ball with him a couple of times at the Raptors Republic tournament, and that dude did not ever see a shot he did not like, no matter who was guarding him and where he <laughs> took it from. That's that's what I remember about uh, Assad. Uh, yeah. uh, let's move on to uh, Siakam's uh, ball handling a little bit because we saw yesterday him being more of a creator at times and the possession starting off with Siakam with the ball. And, and that's a strategy that actually paid off during the bubble. And even against the Celtics, when Siakam had the ball to start the possession, we fared better when he was kind of off to the side. How do you, how, how do you see that part of his game evolving this year? Siakam, I think um, people look at him and they go, okay, this guy's frame wise for a big man. He's a guy that he's a, he's a four for a reason. You can't really play Siakam at the five consistently just like you can't do that OG Ananobi but Siakam relatively is a pretty big guy 6'9 230 um so the fact that he has uh, I would I would consider a pretty advanced dribbling game at this point in his career this early um is is quite the accomplishment I mean Nick Nurse sees the the ability he has in terms of him dribbling the ball and him um I guess potentially being able to really initiate offensive sets I think what we saw last year was a lot of all right, Pascal, you're going to dribble the ball up and you're going to give it off to Marcus Gasol or Kyle Lowry and then the play starts, right? <laughs> um, so when we saw Pascal dribbling the ball up, it was kind of like we were all excited, like, oh my God, Pascal's dribbling the ball up. It's not, you know, Fred Van Fleet or McCaw or Lowry or whoever it was. Um, but I think this year you're going to see a lot more of Siakam actually being the play initiator um, at the top of the key or wherever the play starts, um, which is good news for Siakam. I think Chris Finch said something very important the Raptors offensive coordinator, um, he said something very important where he said, you're going to see Siakam in a lot of new spots this year. He's not going to be um, kind of ran in the same way um, he was utilized last year. Um, and we saw that immediately against Charlotte. He's bringing the ball up and he's initiating plays and Fred Van Vliet's off the ball and Norm's off the ball and all these guys are off the ball. So that's really cool. I want to see Siakam in, um, used in post-ups like he was sometimes last year. I want to see him used um, in triple threats at every level of the court, not just at the top of the key beyond the three-point line. But I think with Siakam, again, it's just going to come to him becoming a smarter NBA player, becoming a smarter creator for his teammates. Um, I don't really think, you know, for what the Raptors need him to do, he has a lot to work on. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he, again, he was all NBA second team for a reason. So Siakam, what we've seen as a dribbler, we might see a little more, but I'm not expecting him to become you know, the new point guard, point guard of the Raptors system, right? Hey, man, to me, he's already Scotty Pippen, uh, you know, uh, the point <laughs> yeah. forward role. He's ready to take that on this year. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Let's, so uh, let, let's end off on, uh, on the Raptors rotation. Um, I think it, it, it sort of slots itself in by itself, but y- your, your thoughts on the one to eight. Yeah. I mean, again, Lowry wasn't there uh, for preseason, but you would obviously expect him to be one. That guy, Lowry, is the engine to the team. He's the point guard. Um, and then you're probably going to see a similar lineup to last season where it's Fred Van Fleet at the two. Um, you have OG at the three, Siakam at the four. And then obviously instead of Gasol or Ibaka, you're going to have Aaron Baines, right? The new Raptors acquisition at the five. Um, we haven't obviously talked a lot about Aaron Baines, um, but Aaron Baines is a guy that I think fits really well with those four. Um, a lot more mobile than Gasol. I don't want to take anything away from Marcus Gasol. He's probably one of the best playmaking bigs you could say in the league um but Aaron Baines is a lot more mobile he can move from from side to side a lot faster which may help the Raptors rotations a lot more um but again there's not as much playmaking so that means that playmaking is going to f- trickle down and fall on more on guys like Siaka more on guys like Ananobi so the one to five is set for the Raptors you know what the starters are going to be sixth man I think is just as set as the one to five it's going to be Norman Powell who's going to be like the offensive punch um, that the Raptors need with the second unit. Seven, eight, nine, I think, is where it gets very interesting, right? You have um, Terrence Davis, who's obviously going through some legal matters himself. I don't want to go into that at all, but you have Terrence Davis, you have Matt Thomas, who we mentioned earlier, um, and then you have Malachi Flynn, right? 
So Malachi Flynn, I think, is where it gets very interesting. Um, from what I saw, and I know this might be um, me just jumping overboard on Malachi, but I think later in the season, you really have to decide if it's worth playing him over a guy like Terrence Davis. And I don't want to take away from Terrence Davis. That guy was all NBA rookie team, second rookie team last year. Um, but again, his future is murky with the team. You don't know what's going to happen with him. Um, seven, eight, nine is kind of like, I guess it's just where Nick Nurse is like, okay, who's hot? And then they kind of play the most minutes out of that seven, eight, nine group. Also, matchups. You don't want Matt Thomas playing against uh, extensively against one of the best offensive teams in the league. Um, and then 10, 11, 12 is, is where it also is interesting. I think Paul Watson's almost guaranteed a spot um, there. O'Shea Brissett has a very good leg up on the other guys. Um, am I forgetting a play? Alex Len, who the Raptors also signed, is probably going to be their backup five, yeah. and they're going to play him against bigger teams. So yeah. um, I would say those 12 are probably um, – I say the first six are set in stone, seven, eight, nine are almost set in stone. And then you have 10, 11, 12, which is kind of like, depending on what happens in preseason, depending on obviously what happens with injuries, those 10, 11, 12 are kind of where Nick Nurse has to decide um, what's going on. Yeah. And I think the only thing I will, I will add to that is you, you, you talked about Terrence Davis and Malachi Flynn with that, with that rotation spot at the seven, eight, maybe. Um, I just think, uh, you know, the person who can hit the three more consistently will probably yeah. get the edge on that one. And that, that, that yeah. that's my barometer of like who might uh, uh, get that. So um, yeah, I mean, it looks to be exciting. So, okay. Let, let's end it off with the, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I need yeah. a win total and a playoff outcome. Okay, so the, again, the season is shortened, so it's 72 games. Um, so um, I think we, I also talked about this on William Liu's podcast. Um, I think the Raptors are going to be right around, I want to say, 45 to 50 wins, yeah. mm-hmm. right? And that translates to, I believe, the low 50s or mid 50s for a yeah. full 82-game season. So I'm going to say... Between 45 to 50 wins. If you want an exact number, I don't know, 47. I'm going to say 40, 46, 47. Um, so that's where I think they'll stand. In terms of standings in the Eastern Conference, I have the Raptors pegged right now as the third seed. Um, I have the Milwaukee Bucks above them and then the Boston Celtics. Now, again, this could change. The Philadelphia 76ers, I think, are a better team than they were last year. There's a lot more balance there. Finally, Daryl Morey put shooters around Embiid and Simmons, so... That team's look, looking a lot better. Um, but I have them pegged as the third seed. And then in terms of a playoff outcome, you know, this is where your brain and your heart start colliding. Oh, big time. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go second round out. Um, I think, unfortunately, I think when it really comes down to it, I think the 70, a team like the 76ers have, you know, the – Oh, man, this hurts to say, man, because... We're not losing to the Sixers, dude. We're not losing to the Sixers. It's not going to happen. You know, if we face the Celtics, the Bucks, I think we're the clear underdog. Uh-huh. Um, 76ers, I think it's just about even. I think maybe we might have, like, a, we might have the... the, the uh, in terms of evens and odds, we might have... Um, what's the word I'm thinking of? We're the favorite. Oh, my goodness. We're the favorite against 76ers, but I can also see the 76ers beating us. So... Okay. Um, I'm going to say second round out to either the Bucks, the Celtics, or the 76ers. Um, if we do make the Eastern Conference Finals, I think this was a fantastic season for Toronto. Um, this, compared to la- the last few seasons, is kind of, I don't want to say a throwaway in terms of championship aspirations, but Raptors fans have to be a lot more... Um, I don't, I'm very careful with my words because I don't want to get destroyed. You're not in a court of law, dude. Just say it out. Yeah. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's deposition. <laughs> yeah. Raptors fans just have to be a lot more, um, okay with, with Toronto possibly losing in the second round. It's a bridge year. First round, it's a bridge I think year. It's almost, yeah. I think it's first round is almost a guaranteed you're getting through the first round. You look at the bottom half of the Eastern Conference, the Orlandos, even the Atlantas. Like Atlanta's supposed to take a step up, but, they have like one defender on that team. So yeah. um, I'm expecting a second round out. Anything above that is, is, uh, is gravy for Toronto. Sahal, thank you so much for coming on and giving us your uh, thoughts on this. I mean, you there in the background, you have a Spurs Jersey there, Tottenham Hotspur. 
Uh, I will do my best to crop that out <laughs> of this video because we can't yeah. possibly have that on here. I hear you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, other than that, other than watching that for the last 40 minutes, uh, yeah. it's been a great conversation and uh, hope to have you back soon, man. It is. I appreciate, I appreciate you having me on, Zara. I really appreciate it.